Hey there, welcome back everyone to r slash Entitled People. In today's episode, Karen parks in a worksite, refuses to move, and gets trapped when work proceeds as planned, and for the cherry on top, also gets into a bit of trouble with the police. So guys, I hope you enjoy, subscribe for future videos, and we're jumping right in. A band of Karens helping themselves to the condiments before the wedding. Sit back and prepare to shake your head to what society has come to these days. This is a twofer. This happened in October 2018, and I remember it like it was yesterday. There is a mansion located in the next city, where an oil baron built and lived. The city ended up owning the mansion 40 plus years ago, and have maintained the grounds and opened it up to the public, for its historical significance to the area. You can use this as a venue for weddings, reunions, and parties, if you reserve it fast in advance, and pay the $2,000 price tag. The mansion has hours of operation, and at closing, it's private. My daughter and her wedding party began to set up at 10 a.m. Saturday morning, using the rooms that are not open to the public. Arranged tours were stopped at 10 a.m. since there was a wedding about to happen. For the ballroom, which was to remain accessible to the public, we pushed all the tables and chairs to a corner of the ballroom, which surrounded the wedding cake and condiments as they arrived. The beer and wine was placed in the old serving kitchen, which was supposed to be closed to the public, only open to arranged tours, the tubs of ice and soft drinks, peanuts, mints, and utensils were at the opposite corner of the ballroom. Again, behind rows of chairs, the wedding planner showed up at noon and started setting up the floral arrangements and faux candles, since flames are not allowed. The wedding is to begin at 7 o'clock, two hours after close, which gave us plenty of time to rearrange the chairs and stage the cake, drinks, etc. At about 3 o'clock, the wedding planner catches me and asks if the mansion is haunted. I told her, not that I'm aware of. And she tells me, the candles keep disappearing in this one area. She keeps replacing them. They keep disappearing, and she is about to run out. It turns out, the public was helping themselves to the candles, the peanuts, the mints, and the soft drinks. I catch a couple of Karens fingering the wedding cake to see if it was real, eating the frosting, mints, peanuts, and helping themselves to the shift drinks. They made a path through the rows of chairs. Advocate Father of the Bride Rage Mode I had family members guard key locations in the ballroom to keep them secure. When the Karens got upset that they weren't allowed to roam as they pleased, they complained to the hosts of the mansion. It got verbal, and it got loud. I even caught them getting into the plastic pumpkin where the monetary gifts were dropped. So promptly at 5 o'clock, I had the entire family run the public out, and the Karens knew that they always cleaned up about an hour after close, and they were going to stay. Not today, Karen. Part 2. This was posted in the Am I the A-hole section first. You wouldn't believe the responses some people have. Public places equals they have a right to be there, anywhere. How was the public to know they weren't allowed to help themselves to the food? You should have made signs. You should have had the food covered. Signs and covers don't stop entitled people. What I don't understand is how some of the people in Am I the A-hole actually thought that these people were in the wrong. Because you would think that it would be assumed if you saw a wedding cake, you probably shouldn't be poking it and eating the frosting. And not even to mention that they got into the plastic pumpkin that had monetary gifts in it, aka money I'm assuming. Long story short, I think it'd be pretty obvious to know that this stuff isn't yours to touch. Lady steals lamb because it was rejected by its mother. This isn't my story, but my teacher's. So my teacher owns a small flock of sheep, and she absolutely adores them, and since it's spring here, they've started having lambs. They're adorable. So the other day, while my teacher was at school, her elderly mother was visiting, and she spots this lady in their driveway trying to steal a lamb. This lady said to her mother, I'm trying to take this lamb because it's obviously been rejected by its mother. Which it obviously was not, since my teacher was saying that the lamb's mother was taking care of her well. She suspects that this lady wanted to take the lamb because it was covered in mud. It's been heavily raining here for the past few days. This lady then is acting really aggressively and pressures my teacher's elderly mother into giving her the lamb. The lady that stole this lamb is part of an animal rescue shelter in the area, and they made a post about this precious lamb that was surrendered into our care, and they named the lamb. They also claim to be doing God's work, but I don't think stealing animals is God's work. This animal rescue shelter has a history of pressuring people into giving up their well-cared-for animals. One of my friend's neighbor's pigs was stolen and has now become the mascot of their animal shelter. I'm trying to help my teacher figure out what to do, since she's a really sweet lady and she's scared to confront this animal shelter. Any advice? Here's an edit. So she called the shelter owner asking for her lamb back, 
and the shelter owner asked what she was going to do with the lamb. My teacher, not thinking correctly, said, Well, the plan is to eat it since it's a sustainable food source for our family. She then gasped and said, oh, I can't let you take him back since I'm a vegan and I've grown really attached to him. My teacher has since given up, but we're supporting her as best we can and encouraging her to go to the police with this information so that this shelter can be called out and not do this again. She's not going to go to the police about it, but I'm hoping she will. So much for being an animal rescue shelter sounds like quite the opposite. You aren't going anywhere for a while. This involves a rather popular bar in a major northern UK city, Animal Karen. It was early in the day, and the bar wasn't open until 7pm that evening. I arrived at the bar, my task for the day being to await a scaffold being delivered and erected, and then use the said scaffold to remove some old CCTV cameras and upgrade them to much better ones. I have a full set of keys for the bar, and the bar has its own private car park which is protected by locking drop-down bollards. They're not automatic or anything fancy like that, so I have to pull up on the street outside, lock my van up, walk over and drop the bollards, usually with the mandatory soaking, as the pits they're installed in invariably fill up with rainwater. And then finally I pull my van inside. I usually then raise the bollards to stop others parking in there. The place in question is extremely close to the Social Security Benefits Office, and the bollards were indeed installed because their clientele were constantly using it, rather than paying to park like the rest of the population. So this morning I pulled in, got out of my van, and dropped the bollards so I could park in the car park. The scaffold truck with the team on was about 20 minutes behind me, so I had time to go in and have a quick walk to the coffee shop just around the corner. Unfortunately, just after I dropped the bollards, male Karen drove up in his BMW X5, pulled into the car park, and parked. I followed him in and also parked. I tapped on his window and told him it was a private car park and he needed to leave. He was on a hands-free call and he simply gestured me away. So I tapped again and he wound down his window and shouted, I'm on an effing phone call, wound his window back up and began ignoring me. Although I could have been really malicious and locked him in, I didn't. I simply walked around the corner and got my coffee, leaving the bollards down so he could leave if he wanted. About five minutes later I came back, coffee in hand. He was still there, still on the phone, and I could see the scaffold lorry at the bottom of the hill making its way up. Again, I tapped on his window, and he mouthed F off at me. The lorry arrived. I gestured them to reverse into the small car park, which they did. It blocked up the whole car park. The team of three rather big muscular scaffolders jumped out and started unloading and building the scaffold, a fairly big affair made of around 50 bars and over four levels up the back of the building. Ten minutes passed, and the first levels were starting to appear like a rather fascinating Meccano set. I don't know the first thing about this stuff, so I just watched in awe as they flung together bars and planks like monkeys on speed. Male Karen finished his important call and then got out of his rather fancy X5 and walked across to the social services building. I presume he thought we'd all be done by the time he got out so he could just jump in his car and drive off. Almost an hour passed. The scaffold got taller and wider and the lorry got emptier. But there was still a whole level to go on top yet and as they get higher, the build speed slows down. I gave them a hand by passing parts up, but I couldn't actually do anything else because I wasn't skilled or qualified. Male Karen came back after about an hour and ten away and said to me, You have to let me out. He started to get aggressive and pushed me, at which point the scaffolders came down and started to back me up. They looked scary. He didn't. He jumped in his X5 and sat there on his phone. Ten minutes later, the police roll up. Apparently, he'd phoned them because we were blocking him in and had threatened him. I talked calmly to the police officer and explained what had actually happened, explaining that with it being a bar, the whole incident was on CCTV. I gave them my details and the details of my company, and the scaffolders did the same. Then the second officer started checking our vehicles. I thought this was a bit curious, but whatever. So the first officer then asked the scaffolders if they could indeed move and let the guy out, and they obliged, although it took them a couple of minutes to throw some ties over their load. We were all very compliant, although the police did tell us off. It is an offense to knowingly obstruct someone or block someone in a car park or parking space, even on private land. Male Karen then got in his BMW and reversed out through the gates, at which point the second officer gestured him to pull the car up on the road and get out of it. So it transpired after a little more questioning that male Karen had neither road tax, insurance, nor did he even have a driving license. 
The reason the police had to let him get out of the car park was because no crime was being committed until he attempted to drive it. Once he attempted that, he was in contravention of the Road Traffic Act and they could seize his car. Thus, the final piece of the story involves the police sending him to walk down to the bus stop while the second officer drove his two-year-old BMW X5 to the impound yard where he would have to pay a lot of money to get it back and could only get it back if someone with a valid license and insurance went to collect it. I found out later that had he paid the £2.70 parking ticket, he would have been over £1,100 better off that day after getting the cost of the car back, plus the hefty fine he was given for driving without the correct documentation or qualification. And that, my friends, is a Karen just digging their own grave. No one even had to do anything for this guy to get his karma. They just got to sit back and watch. Leave me alone. I'm a retired United States Marine Corps veteran. On 9-11, I went to a couple of remembrance events with other veterans while wearing my uniform. We were outside waiting for one of our friends to pull up, when suddenly, this woman comes up and questions our military status. It went something like this. What do you think you're doing in those uniforms? Said the woman. We're veterans and just waiting on our ride, responded one of the veterans. Don't respond to her, we don't need to explain anything, I said. Oh, stolen valor, I should call the cops, said the woman. Why would you do that? We've served for this country and you're going to call the cops. For what? I asked. Ma'am, they're veterans and I am too. Why would you call the police? Said an out of uniform cop. Then why do they have their uniforms on, huh? Asked the woman. We're here to remember the lives lost, I said. She then takes out her phone and calls 911. The out of uniform cop looks at her. Why are you harassing them? I'm a cop, what do you want? Said the cop. The woman looks in shock. I don't believe you. You're just like them, she said. The cop walks to his car and gets out his badge and shows it to her. No, you're just a rent-a-cop, said the woman. No, he's an actual cop. He's in charge of the station, I added. I need proof of that, she said. We all watched as the cops pulled up and greeted him. Then they shake our hands. See, they're under me. I can get you charged for harassment, said the cop. She then turns red in the face and starts stuttering. I, uh, I I'm so sorry, then turns and runs off. I would have showed her my veteran ID, but I was honestly tired of her. Entitled Karen thinks the bus is a free shuttle service. So I was on the bus last night, heading home from visiting my partner. The bus was just starting his route from the station, so a few people got on, including myself. Now I'm in Sydney, and the way Sydney buses go is that we have what we call Opal readers to pay for the bus. You need to tap on to get on the bus with either a credit card or what's called an Opal card topped up with money to tap on with. The issue with these readers is that they're not always reliable, and many dishonest people try to cheat the system to get a free ride, tapping on with a card with no money, or an unregistered card, and then claiming that they didn't know, or they were too poor. And really, it's not hard to do since drivers don't typically care. Now back to the story. I and a few others got on the bus, and the first stop after starting the route was our Karen stop. Karen walks on with earbuds in her ears, walks straight past the driver and the opal reader, and just sits down without paying. Now this driver was an older looking gentleman, who seemed nice enough, but didn't seem like one to take much crap from people. He calls out to Karen a few times from his seat, saying things like, Ma'am, you need to tap your opal card. And I don't know if it was because she was being ignorant or she literally couldn't hear him, but Karen just ignores him, continuing to look down at her phone. This is when the driver gets up from his seat, looking visibly frustrated, and goes straight up to her. Ma'am, didn't you hear what I said? He asks. What? What's the problem? Karen snaps back. The driver again explains that she didn't tap her opal card on the reader, and she needs to do so. I don't have my opal card with me. Our spawn of Satan barks. Well, have you got a credit card you can tap? The driver asks. No, I have nothing. Can't you just let it slide this one time? The driver this morning didn't care. For clarity, our Karen was toting around a massive leather handbag, had sunnies on top of her head for some reason since it was nighttime, and was wearing a business suit, looking like she was going home from work. I doubt she had nothing on her that she could pay with. The driver, looking like he's absolutely done with this Karen by this point, looks at her and says, Do I look like the driver you had this morning? If your answer is no, then you need to either tap on an Opal card or credit card, or find some other way home. Karen is looking shook at this point, since she was obviously not expecting such a response. She huffs like a typical Karen and says, Fine, you are holding up everyone, stopping them from getting home. How selfish could you be? I'll pay just to shut you up. 
She whips out a credit card, slams it against the opal reader, and it takes her three tries to even tap on properly, since slapping your card against the reader makes it so much harder for it to actually read the card. But she taps on successfully, and sits down in a huff, still going on about how ridiculous this is, and how she doesn't deserve this treatment. Everyone on the bus is literally looking at Karen like she's an absolute nut, and I just couldn't help but to laugh as silently as possible through my mask. She keeps muttering silently to herself for half the ride, until her stop comes up and she storms off the bus, without tapping off. Which is another thing about Opal. If you don't tap off, it'll just keep charging you money until either all your money is gone, or the driver ends the route. So I hope you enjoyed your karma, Karen. You sure did make my night. I'd want to see the look on her face when she saw that extra big charge on her credit card, since she never tapped off. Alright guys, that's it for today. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, give this video a thumbs up. And also, be sure to subscribe if you haven't yet. Have an incredible day everyone. Stay safe, stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.